Dennis Giza, thanks for joining us for My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. Welcome to Melbourne for the CyberCon. Thank you very much. Uh, your first time in Melbourne, I understand, uh, and you're on the back of DEF CON uh, in terms of your cybersecurity research, mm -hmm. uh, particularly focused on robots. So we cover robots and, and drones in a range of different areas as well as cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. What's your general message when you come to, to conferences like this? Uh, you're presenting either your research or do you kind of come with a, a, a warning or message along the way? So um, primarily I present my research, uh, but sometimes uh, I feel that I, I wouldn't necessarily say warning, but like aware, uh, want to raise awareness of like the abilities of devices so that people are kind of more aware of what kind of functionality devices have. It's not necessarily that I say you don't get them. I mean, I have them myself, I use them, but uh, just be aware of what they can do. Well, you got to sort of root access to four robots and you found vulnerabilities in all devices. Mm -hmm. I think that is a, a sort of a key message there, but particularly that these devices do have uh, inherent vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, how much confidence does that give you moving forward, I suppose, when we see the explosion of robotics and autonomous systems, uh, some now dealing with critical infrastructure and the like, uh, how much of a, a, a risk do you see there, a digital risk, uh, moving forward? So, I mean, my experience is like for like 54 robots and also lawnmowers, which I have, and I got root access to all of them. And for me, um, it's kind of interesting um, to see like the development of robotics. As, and there was a talk uh, before my talk yesterday from like someone from NATO who was presenting like uh, battle bots. And I was like, mm, I don't know if it's a good idea. I mean, if a big company like uh, who, who sells like millions of these devices, like vacuum robots, um, if they have trouble to make their devices secure, then how like you know like even military contractors can make their stuff secure. So uh, that gives me a, you know a little bit worry, but uh, yeah, I mean it's you know outside of my um, basically pay grade to kind of decide <laughs> that. Well, the trouble is I've been doing this for a while, and you can, these vulnerabilities continue to be found. Mm -hmm. Do you find any pattern within the vulnerabilities? Is it particularly uh, some type or aspect of the of the device itself? Uh, is it software driven or is there vulnerabilities in the hardware as well or, or firmware? Uh, so it's both. Um, when I started initially this was primarily software vulnerabilities um, but I must say also I'm a very like driven to get root access so I spent a lot of time even if it takes, takes me like weeks to kind of find things um, yep. and I develop techniques and getting better and better. Uh, I'm still probably like way away from like nation state actors but I you know I have like some expertise nowadays but I am very quick at finding things. And the last couple ones which I found were like basically hardware vulnerabilities where I feel it would be very, very difficult for the vendors to patch them also. It's like uh, I feel the current generation of released robots is kind of lost for, you know, it can't be fixed anymore. Yeah. But um, I'm curious what the next generation will bring. Do you find that you target the, the, the device itself rather than the software? Do you follow any particular methodology? Um, so typically, I mean, I disassemble, as soon as I get the device, I disassemble to get an idea of what I'm dealing with. Yeah. Um, and then I just try to find like um, the bugging pins, if I can get it, uh, the solar flash, see if I can um, extract any unencrypted information. And then I have like some, um, I would say, not necessarily zero days, but like, vulnerabilities, um, which um, many chips have, and I use them to kind of extract even information like from a secured memory and encryption, encrypted memory basically. And I suppose lastly is uh, the, the key message for security by design and safer by design, uh, is there any sort of key principles there that you would follow uh, or recommend uh, for the manufacturers? Well um, one thing uh, which I notice kind of like as a pattern is that if you have startups that they start with very insecure um, you know design and um, this kind of bites them in the long term because there is some legacy kind of software which is on the device still. So if you design um, a system like from the start with like insecurity in, in mind, then I think you have a better chance to kind of defend against things. But again, it kind of depends on what kind of attacker you're dealing with. Um, in the end of the day, um, vacuum robots and also other like smart speakers generally, uh, like um, what Amazon sells, uh, these are not military grade security devices. So. Yeah. You know, if someone puts a lot of time into it and resources into it, they will always get like a you know brute access on them. And I suppose the key problem is that the uh, they're listening, they're watching, uh, and sensing all sorts of different things as well. I think that's the key point uh, in terms of people's privacy, particularly if it's a commercial consumer product. Yeah, um, one thing I think which is kind of important to stress is that I'm not claiming that the companies are actually spying on you necessarily, but. The devices have enough sensors that they theoretically could do that. And what most people don't realize is that um, the device which you have at home, the vendor like who produced the device has full control over the device itself and 
the data which is stored on the device because we can basically, if we want to, we could push like a firmware update onto it. You wouldn't even notice it. We could just change the functionality of yeah. the device. So that's something which is, people should kind of keep in mind that ultimately you don't necessarily own the device, but the company is like the, the And you the certainly don't own the data. They own the data. Correct. Yes. Right. Um, the other thing I found of interest with you is you are leading the MIT rocket uh, team, right? You're building rockets as well. Yeah, this kind of hobby, I'm not leading it, but I'm uh, building like uh, telemetry um, kind of devices um, if we want to lo launch a rocket so that we find it afterwards if we get the data back. Uh, sometimes, um, I mean, it's a student a student club, right? So Got it. Um, if rockets crash, which they, <laughs> they do very often, they explode very often, then I'm also responsible for like, you know, try to get the data from the flash memory if the flash is cracked, if like there's like just a burning rumble afterwards. And that's kind of like my, you know, uh, I wouldn't say hobby necessary, but this is just a student club, which I'm kind of doing. Um, now, you're a PhD researcher. What, what's your sort of career progression? Where, where are you going to take things further into the future? So, uh, initially I thought uh, of primarily doing teaching, but I'm not sure right now about that. So, I'm kind of like in the um, split phase where I need to decide, like, okay, do I go to industry, ba back to industry because I came from industry, or if I stay in academia, um, and I'm still not even sure if I want to stay in the US, if I go back to Europe. So it's kind of like, there's a lot of like, so I'm kind of like in this uh, state where it's very uncertain right now. Well, you're definitely one to watch. Uh, we're here at the Acer CyberCon in Melbourne, but thank you very much, uh, Dennis, for joining us on our Tech and Sec Weekly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you.